so we'll start in two minutes and i think the lecture slides like the slide deck has been uploaded to piazza you all can follow with that uh, today me and sarthak will be giving out this recitation too on network optimization so uh, yeah you should also fill the piazza poll so that we get a sense of where you are on the homework so that way we can decide upon tomorrow's boot camp Good afternoon, everyone. Today, uh, me, I'm Varun, and I'm joined by Sarthak. We'll be giving out recitation two on network optimization. This recitation will cover a lot of aspects that you'll require for your homework one P two. It will cover data manipulation, model architecture, hyper uh, hyperparameter optimization, and will give you out some tips and tricks that would help you cross the higher cutoffs on homework one P two. This will also be beneficial for the next consecutive homeworks, and let's get started. So first, we have data manipulation. Uh, there are three things that we do in data manipulation. One is we check the data quality, augmentation, and then we normalize the data. So, what is data quality? As deep learning students, data is our bread and butter. We kind of take this data and pass it through our models, and if the data quality is bad, then the model training is obviously going to be bad so we have to make sure that we get the most out of the data that we have and data is often very hard to find and whenever we have data it's mostly unusable we have to pre process it and we have to apply all these techniques and uh, filters to kind of re remove the noise out of this data in order to make sure that this data is useful for us right so for this specific homework we are given with the speech recognition waveforms and the lib see, the libre speech from where we have extracted the data gives us speech waveforms and we have provided to you mfccs so what is the process of this waveform to mfccs right so we take the waveforms and we apply a short time fourier transform on the waveform to convert it from time domain to frequency domain then we apply a melb filter bank and then we take a logarithm of that to reduce the dynamic range then after that we perform some inverse uh, discrete cosine transform idct to convert the frequency domain to the sepstrel domain and then we keep the coefficients of these sepstrel uh, sepstrel domains to get the homework 1 p2 data that we have so as the students we are given the homework uh, we are given the sepstrel domain data and we have already done this pre processing for you but when you are going out there in the real world this might be something that you would have to uh, pre process yourself right so coming to data normalization what is data normalization so often when we have multi dimensional data right the scale of each dimensions are different and therefore it becomes different for the model to understand which dimension should it prefer or which dimension should it give more importance to so we try to do data normalization data normalization is the process that kind of scales the data and normalizes it so that each of the dimensions are given equal opportunity or importance by the model in this specific task we are doing sepstrel mean normalization as we are working with the sepstrel domain what we are doing is we are kind of uh, removing any variations in the sepstrel coefficients that are caused by variations in the overall level of the speech signal so this is important because the overall level of speech signal can vary greatly depending on factors such as distance between the speaker and the microphone right 
and there can also be background noises and some speakers can have different speaking style as well. So this, this exceptional mean normalization makes sure that uh, we kind of normalize such noises and make sure the data is noise free and normalized in general. You also have to pro, uh, perform exceptional mean normalization on the data set that we have given to you. So this would be like a task that you would perform in your data set class. What is data augmentation, right? So it is often that any kind of data that we kind of collect is less for the model. We always need more data. And by performing some tricks and picks, like tricks, we can just augment more data. We can get more data. And how do we do that? So there are various techniques that we do in image or like for speech. And as we are focusing on the speech recognition data set right now, uh, we'll be talking about two data augmentation tricks that you can perform, but it's like an optional trick. So we would suggest you to kind of make sure that your training pipeline is there, like it's working. And once you are able to cross the low and medium cutoffs, then you could uh, kind of consider to perform data augmentations. So the two data augmentations that we have are time and frequency masking. So the data set that we have is two dimensional, like in terms of frequency and time. So there are coefficients, which are the frequency domain, and then there is a time axis. So frequency mask, King is kind of the process where you mask out some frequency and you don't give that frequency to the model. And you can use this, uh, use the inbuilt function in PyTorch audio. I think it's torch audio to perform this frequency masking. And there is similarly a time masking, which masks the time. And you can like just kind of start with using the normal coefficients, hyperparameters that are given by torch audios. And then you can ask for TAs about more hints, or you can just read out about papers which use such techniques to perform data augmentation, right? Coming to model architecture. All right, uh, before we move forward with model architecture, uh, is exceptional normalization clear to everyone? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question about that. In the data normalization, you mentioned like four different um, common techniques that are used, but how do we know which one we should use? So uh, you can start out with some one of out of the four things, right? And then basically you can just read about that out of these four, which one should we kind of do, right? So all of these things are just experiments. We never know what we should do. And there's like no given uh, algorithm or like a path that we should follow. But I think that's why there is a study group. And if you have four people in your study group, what you all can do is you all can take one kind of augmentation and then report your uh, study with like all of your friends. And then once you have like, you know, okay, so two out of the four are working, then you should apply them together. So that's how we generally do these sampling studies. Um, all right. So I mean, in case we were working with images, why would we do augmentation in the first place? Like, why do we need data augmentation? Yeah, uh, good. More amount, so more amount of data would result in better like, better performance in the Yeah, sure. Uh, that's good. What? Why else? It's probably the case of rotation. Maybe I just like, for example, here yeah. the, the rotation is going to get interesting for images that are active for having the data set. All right, so what you're talking about is rotation invariance. So the model should not have to worry about exact uh, angle of the cat. Why else? You had something else? I was just going to say general rotation. The overfit, so the perfect angle. So like the cat doesn't always have to be outdoors. So it should not overfit to the background, correct? Any other reason can anyone think of? I mean, this is all good, yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Um, if a particular data has a significant overfitting compared to one part, but like the one thing in the data set are just very few as compared to the two different data sets, the data is more like more likely to break two. Okay. So you you want the proportion for the one position. So this is more about balancing different classes in the data set. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, so data augmentation is is does someone has any other confusion on this topic? 
And what about substrate mean normalization? Is this clear to everyone? What it is, why do we do it? Has anyone written code for it? So, yeah, go ahead. Do you ever use multiple norms, like no conversation norms? Or just do you do one? Can you use like min max scaling and then substrate mean? Um, you can try. I haven't tried that yet, so I can't tell if what would the result be. Um, the reason we normalize it is uh, to, like, in, in general, basic normalization is you subtract by mean, divide by standard deviation. So you make sure all the uh, features are, are, you know, similarly distributed. So combining two normalizations might defeat the purpose because then you won't really know which, like, what you end, end up with. But I would still say you can try and tell me what the results were, if you could get a good result. What else? Uh, is everyone else clear how to perform substrate normalization? <laughs> like, does everyone know how would you write this in code? Yes. Yeah, so did, anyone, uh, so did anyone read the write-up? So in write-up also we covered uh, this in like, probably a page roughly. All right. Um, so what we can do it probably here is, uh, tomorrow is the bootcamp. So by bootcamp, I would appreciate if everyone just reads a write-up about this and figures out if they can code it. The code should not take more than one line. Uh, so, and if you still struggle, just bring it up back in bootcamp and then and we'll discuss it further. Okay, so model architecture. Assuming you are done with the very low cutoff, you just ran everything once, all your notebook was working well. Um, we started with a, like a single linear layer kind of architecture, um, and which will obviously not work for the high cutoff. So you have to figure out what kind of, uh, what should be the architecture of your neural network be, uh, which gives you the best performance on the given data set. Now, again, this is more of an art than a science. So it's, it's hard to say exactly which architecture in advance would give you a good result. Um, in general, the, the more deeper your architecture is or the more wider your architecture is, uh, the better your predictions will be. Does anyone agree to this? Like more deeper or more wider would get better results or learn things better? Uh, any reason why? Yeah. More number of trainable parameters. Yes, that's good. So we can, uh, so like, if neural networks are universal function approximator, the more parameters we have, the better we can approximate a function. Um, how do you decide between, like, so there's a parameter limit of 20 million parameters. How do you decide if you should go deeper or, or wider? Because you can have one architecture which goes very deep, let's say 20 layers, and you can have one architecture which goes very wide. So how would you choose what's better? Exactly. So you have to you have to test things around. There is no uh, you know like a thumb rule which I can tell you. Uh, the best way is to run ablations. Uh, start small. Start with a smaller portion of the data set. You don't have to load the entire let's say 2300. You can probably load 10% of it or 20% of it. Yeah, you had a question. Wait, so let's say so is it if you model for some overfitting, is it better to go deeper? You don't squish the data down as much, right? And then if you, um, if you kind of, if you're squashing data down too much, it's like not overwhelming. Yeah. So yeah, that's like the intuition I guess maybe would be, would be a sense that I'm just wondering. Which is a good, I would say, starting point. Um, there's also something called error analysis about figuring out if your model has too high a variance or it has too high a bias and then decide accordingly, but yes, you will have to do some experiments before you can decide uh, if making going wider makes more sense or if you're going deeper more, makes more sense. Any, yeah. Uh, is there a, like a recommended like mapping that for a network because I know it's a network has, but it's very deep that will have like gradient exposing or a gradient vanishing problem. So is there a general guess outline for the upper bound of this like without like adding so uh, yeah, we'll discuss those features also in slight detail, but. Bound you at any point. In fact, like if you're thinking that the gradients might explode, 
we have things like we are going to talk about about gradient clipping which will help you reduce that so we really don't want you to you know think about that okay 20 layers i shouldn't go above that we want you to experiment and analyze what happens after 20 layers so yeah, you can safely go to 20 layers. It will not, uh, like you will, should not, should not run into uh, diver, like your model diverging kind of issue. Uh, any other questions on the architecture? All right. Uh, in general, if you would have been working on a deep learning problem in your research or, or in your other projects, uh, you would generally be looking at doing a literature survey, look at what kind of architectures have worked before and try to start use them as a starting point. Uh, but here you are restricted to using only linear layers, and in general you'll probably use more uh, you know, advanced concepts. So for this homework, your target would be more about discovering your architecture yourself versus finding something which has been very well tested in literature by other researchers. But you can still collaborate with your study group. So you can see uh, you have four people study group, you can see what kind of applications are getting, what kind of results. You can even divide and conquer. And that's how you can try to finalize which architecture is better for this homework. And uh, you will have to find the architecture also, and you will also have to find the correct hyperparameters uh, to get the high cutoff. So a few like uh, just high level terms for what an architecture can be called, because you might be discussing what has worked for you with your friends. So this is what a diamond looks like. You start with a, a very uh, narrow layer, you go wider in between, and then you come back to narrow. So, by the way, what should the output layer size be? If anyone has been reading a write-up, the final uh, dimension or the final size of the output layer. 40. 40, yeah. It should be based on your vocabulary. So if it's 40, 40. What would the input size be based upon? Twenty-seven is the yeah. uh, number of files minus uh, the number of uh, um, positions in every file. Yeah. So twenty-seven is the uh, number, of number of features in a, in a single. Um, uh, uh, and you will also have something called context. So you might club multiple uh, MFCCs together. So that will determine what exactly is your input layer. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact symmetric. I mean, this looks like a, like a very symmetric diagram. You might have uh, a diamond architecture, but it would not be exactly symmetric, which is fine. We are just using it to uh, you know, put a term on it so that we can discuss among ourselves what's working better. Similarly, you will have something like a pyramid architecture. You might start very narrow and go wider as you go deeper, or the other way around. You might start very wide and narrow it down. So you can call one as pyramid, other as inverse pyramid. This is like a cylinder architecture where you just maintain the same width throughout your architecture. Or you can just play around, have some weird looking shape, uh, which you can you know, coin a name yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Yeah. So we'll come uh, on the so which actuation function you're using. We can call it an, like a hyperparameter. So we will we'll like divide between those two things, uh, and you can either experiment on different architectures for the same hyperparameter, and then finalize the architecture first, and then move to experimenting on the hyperparameters, or vice versa. Or you can do it in like do one batch of architecture search get some good enough result, then start searching on the hyperparameter, then come back to the architecture and flip around and see what works better for you. Okay. So does anyone recognize the image? Yeah. And the same ship got stuck again somewhere. So uh, in general, you, we can think of ad that adding more layers can solve a problem, uh, but making an unusually large architecture 
and train it for an abnormally long time frame is not something you would actually do uh, in your practical deep learning projects or your research or in your uh, you know in, in the industry. So we do want you to be more judicious about your compute resources, how much time you should be spending. Uh, so don't go all in. Start with like a smaller subset of data set. Start with smaller number of layers in your architecture so that uh, you can have some kind of patterns developing in the beginning. And then you can probably zero on which direction makes most sense for you. My first step to this homework would be to submit a non-zero sum mean and CAD. Yeah. I think you should also start there. Also, I saw a few submissions on Kegel. Uh, if you were getting zero after all your predictions, it's probably because you are submitting it as an integer value and not converting it back to the phony uh, string. So yeah, keep that in mind too. Uh, there are few activation functions you can you can play with. Uh, it's like ReLU would be the most common one, which you would have heard. Sigmoid, ReLU, Softless, Stanage. See which one works best uh, for any given architecture. Um, you can look at different normalizations. Bashnorm is one of them. There are more. Uh, we'll be covering it in, in uh, more slides. Same for dropout. Um, and I would say uh, that start as early as possible because finding the right architecture takes time. And you don't want to be stuck at the last week of the homework submission, figuring out what architecture should work for you and you know, just redoing the whole experiment over and over again and getting stressed out. So yeah. So we were talking about hyperparameters a little before, right? And what are these hyperparameters? So why do we actually need to tune hyperparameters? Obviously, we want to improve the model accuracy. We want a faster convergence. What is a faster convergence? So it basically means that spending less amount of time to train this model for the same task. We want the model to converge faster and not spend two to three days on the same model, right? So a good training time would be around two to three hours, or probably three to five hours. So um, in, if, you, if you're working with training 300, your per epoch time should not be more than 15 minutes. You can even reduce it down to seven. Uh, more than 15 minutes will make your overall training very good. Right, so seven minutes, and then I believe 10 to 15 epochs, yeah. or even more. So as, you can start yeah. with, I would say, like, just see how model performs in the first five blocks and see if it's worth training it further or not. Right. So based on the initial epochs, you kind of get an estimate of what or how your model is performing. And accordingly, you should like give it more resources or just kill the button. Right. So then what is the work with resource constraints? Right. So resource constraints are obviously there for us. We don't have unlimited resources. The only resource that we have is Google Colab. And we'll also get soon some AWS credits, but don't expect them to be there before starting your homework. So they may come late. They may not come as early as you want, but yeah. And then why do we actually need to tune hyperparameters? Because all of us want to reach the high cutoff, right? So we should train, uh, we should tune the hyperparameters. Now, you might be uh, kind of confused between what are parameters and hyperparameters. So parameters are these uh, things that are internal to the model and that the model learns by itself. Some things like model weights, model biases, all these are the model parameters, right? And then on the other hand, we have some hyperparameters, which we as the practitioners explicitly set up and these things can be like batch size, the learning rate, the scheduling rate, the dropouts, all the things that we as an architect set are called hyperparameters. And you will be often uh, see like discussing about the hyperparameters with your friends, your classmates, and with the TAs. So the game is about deciding the correct hyperparameters, right? So let's start with a hyperparameter, which is the learning rate and the learning scheduler, right? So what is learning rate? Learning rate is uh, one of the most important hyperparameters while training a model. 
it controls how much of the weight are you updating through each mini batch update, right? We have all seen, we do, we perform like an algorithm called gradient descent when we want to go through our data set, learn things, and then update our model weights. And uh, learning rate is actually that parameter that decides how much updation we do in one go, right? The bigger the learning rate, the more updates we'll do, like the larger the size of the mm -hmm. update will be. And oftentimes, we want to start with a higher learning rate, but when the model is converging, we want the updations to be less. And that's why we schedule a learning rate scheduler. So we start big, and then we start reducing our learning rate over time, over convergence. And there are different learning schedules. So there are step, uh, step schedulers, there are linear schedulers, there are exponential schedulers. And schedulers come when you have realized that, okay, this learning rate is not working and I'll have to you know, go for a lower learning rate. So you should look at the learning rate schedulers and Torch obviously have a lot of learning rates schedulers and learning rates with them. So you should go through the documentation and it will help you determine your learning rate and scheduling. Coming to optimizers, uh, we have a lot of optimizers and optimizers are the things like they are the algorithms that take in the loss information and then provide the derivatives, like calculate the derivatives with which we are going to update our model weights. So optimizers like give out how much are we going to update and then we put a learning rate over these optimizers, right? So there are different kind of optimizers and some of them are named in the slide and you can see the figure which kind of shows how like how fast uh, optimizer is converging and you know, there are sort of things like this. Changing optimizers bring in some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, so, so stochastic gradient descent is more locally unstable and Adam at sharp minimums, like Adam has this tendency to kind of escape better from minimums and that's why Adam has a faster convergence rate. But in general, stochastic gradient descent has often been more stable and it kind of performs better over a longer time. But for this homework, we would suggest you to try out with Adam first because it does faster converge. So uh, here are some advantages and disadvantages which you can read out later. Like we have just uh, collected some of the optimizers and just written some advantages and disadvantages, right? Then as we were talking about overfitting earlier, you'll face overfitting a lot of times, and this can be due to a lot of various reasons. Maybe your model can be small. Maybe you're not regularizing perfectly. Maybe you're not normalizing. So whenever we face overfitting, we ask you to regularize. If you have done the regularization and you have still left more data, you should add the more data. Again, if you're overfitting, you should regularize more. So overfitting is basically that problem where your model is kind of understanding the noise between your data and is uh, giving out, like it is a common problem in learning based methods where model learns the details in the training data and it negatively starts impacting our performance. So it often happens when the model is too complex for the training data that we are taking, right? And none of us wants overtraining, like overtraining and overfitting. So, how do we regularize our model? There are a lot of techniques in which we can regularize our model. Dropout is one of them. It's the most uh, important technique, like one of the more important techniques that you will be using more often. What dropout does is it uh, prevents overfitting by randomly dropping out a certain percentage of the neurons during training, right? This forces the network to learn more robust features and not depend on a single or like a couple of individual neurons. And this can reduce the overfitting problem because it allows co-adaptations in the network, right? Then coming to weight initialization. Weight initialization is a process of setting the initial weights for the parameters of a neural network. And, it's, and you do the weight initialization before the training even starts. So this helps us prevent like this helps the network prevent getting stuck in some local poor minimas 
and it also in general improves the speed and stability of your training process. Uh, there are a lot of different eight initializations that you can try out. Different optimizers suggest that you should use different initializations and there are some papers that you should go through. Uh, the most famous ones are Zever initialization and Kaming initialization. And you can look out about, like you can look more about the weight initialization in the PyTorch documentation. So you will be using the PyTorch uh, documentation and the inbuilt functions to do this. Then batch normalization. So as we were talking about sepstral mean normalization, that normalization is done on the data set. Batch, no, batch normalization is done between the training layers, right? So in neural networks, the output of the first layer is feeded to the second layer, and the output of the second layer is feeded to the third layer, and so on. And the parameters of a layer change, so does the distribution of the inputs and subsequent layers change, right? And batch normalization is just a technique used to normalize these subsequent inputs for different subsequent layers and you adjust and scale the activations of the neurons in a way that helps to improve the training stability and reduce internal covariance shift. So batch normalization reduces the internal covariance shift by normalizing the consequent input, subsequent inputs in each layer, making the training process more stable and less sensitive to the initial weight loss, All right? How do we perform batch normalization? So in PyTorch, you will be using the batch normalization directly, but we still have that in the homework, right? And to perform batch normalization, you take the output of activations of the layers, and then you subtract the batch mean and divide them with the batch standard deviation. There's a formula, it is also there in the write-up, and you'll be doing it in the homework 1P1. Uh, you also learn like a set of learnable parameters called gamma and beta, and these are used to scale and shift the normalized activations. You would wonder why we learn these parameters, right? So this is because there are some non-linearities non in the data, and we don't want to lose them when we actually normalize the data. That's why we kind of still have gamma and beta to accommodate these non-linearities. Okay, so batch normalization is done in training, and we kind of keep a running mean and variance during the training phase so that we can use them later on during the testing. This is because batch normalization is applied to each mini batch of the data during training, and it would not be possible to normalize the test data using the mini batch <laughs> statistics because we generally take like a smaller instance while testing our model. Right, so what are the benefits of batch normalization? It can help stabilize the training of deep neural networks, and it kind of normalizes the distribution. It also helps in the training speed and reduces the dependence on initial weight, initial values and weights and biases. Uh, batch normalization is a powerful tool that can help you improve the stability of your training process. What are some other techniques? So. To prevent overfitting, we often use early stopping, which makes the model stop at an earlier stage and helps us prevent the overfitting. And you can just check out early stopping from these, uh, like early stopping has, like you can perform this algorithm using PyTorch inbuilts. And then there is also called a uh, technique that is called gradient clipping, which is used to perform like which is used to kind of get away from the situation where your gradients are exploding. We don't want exploding gradients when we are using uh, deeper networks, and that's why we are using gradient clipping. These are some optional things that you might not require for your first homework, but in case you might want to try out if you are stuck somewhere, you can try these other techniques as well. So are there any doubts in all these hyperparameters? I think there are a lot of them, but by the end of the semester, you all will get a good idea of them. Yes? Affecting batch normalization. Yeah. It means that we do the same epoch mm -hmm. for every batch that we input as training. Mm -hmm. We uh, standardize uh, using the matrix, the, the, the matrix of that particular batch. Right. So it happens inside the model 
it's not that it's not a thing that we perform with the data. It's a thing that we perform internally the model. So like it's between first and second layer, second and third layer, and we want that to happen so that the data is still normalized even between our layers. Okay. Right. Uh, any other doubts? Yep. Um, why do we want to use scheduling over most? How does changing the scheduling by some function change like the overall training function? Right. So what happens is that once you are training with some learning rate, for example, 0 0.1, right? Mm -hmm. You come to a point where the model is just not learning more, right? And I think that we can just assume this kind of minima to be a minima that we want for a model, but there's still some performance left out of the model where we can try to get that model out, like get that performance out by using a smaller learning rate, right? And you can manually set that learning rate, but again over epochs, how will you go and like, you know, again and again there back to just set the learning rate, right? So we, that's why I use like a learning rate and we often use this learning rate as a parameter which depends on a different parameter, which is like a loss. So we apply it in such a way that if the loss is not changing for like 10 epochs, we kind of reduce the learning rate. And if the loss doesn't stop, then like if it doesn't reduce, then we use an early stopping, right? So if it reduces, that's what we write. That's what we want, right? So that's how we use the learning rate scheduler. Any other doubts? All right, so moving on to efficient training and logging. So yeah, about the learning rate, uh, what happens if the learning rate is too large? What happens, yeah? Yeah, so it will keep on oscillating. Uh, what happens if the learning rate is too small? So, so hence we're using the scheduler so that we can probably start with a larger learning rate and then go towards smaller as our model improves. So is like everyone clear with the hyperparameters? Um, why do we need uh, an activation between linear layers? Like, why do we use activations between linear layers? Because we want, like, because we want to have non-linearity in our model. Otherwise, like any combination of linear functions would be a linear function. Yeah. So all the hidden layers will collapse into a single linear layer, right? Okay. Uh, how would you tell what all activations? you can use or what a loss can you use or what an optimizers can you use? Where would you find a list of these functions? Like we showed a few optimizers, but maybe we are hiding some good optimizers. I'm not showing on a slide. So how would you find more optimizers to experiment with or more loss functions? Yeah, exactly. So what kind of loss would you be looking for? Like are we doing classification or Regression. Good. Uh, all right. So next question comes about how do you reduce your training time? And we had, sorry. Yeah. We had a comment left on the starter notebook about something called mixed position. Uh, did anyone look into that comment or the link that was provided? So if your training time is too large, or in general you're trying to reduce your per epoch training time, this is something you should definitely look at. Uh, it will, I mean, for the right GPUs, it might cut your training time into half, which would be great when you're working with a larger data set, uh, train clean 360. Um, so the way mixed position works is most of uh, our calculations happen by default on 32, uh, floating point 32, 32 bits, uh, but some, Parameters, for example, the parameters of linear layer or convolution layer, they can also be computed uh, on a 16, uh, float 16. So mixed position, what it does is, without uh, losing accuracy, it tries to do a 16-bit uh, computation on, on parameters which, which can be done on float 16, and a, th a full uh, float 32 on things which require 32. And then it combines them together. So this ensures that we can have faster calculations wherever uh, float 16 will work well for us. 
Now, we don't have to worry about which parameters are better for float 16, which parameters are better for float 32. That has been taken care of by PyTorch. And if you open the link, you'll see a code like this. Now, there are two things we're using basically in mixed precision. One is something called AutoCast, and second is uh, the scalar. So these are two different things. AutoCast is what actually implements mixed precision uh, to, to figure out what we can, what calculations we can do with float 16 and get away with it. Uh, but there's a slight chance that your gradients might vanish because of using AutoCast. So hence we use the scalar, which, which scales the, our, our gradients to ensure that uh, we don't run into the vanishing problem. So I would recommend using both together, although you can try experiment with just using AutoCast and see what kind of results you get. A uh, slight caveat, because we also talked about gradient clipping. What was gradient clipping? Why do we, like what is gradient clipping? Why do we use gradient clipping? Yeah, good. Stopping you in the middle. Okay. So, yeah, good. Uh, it's stopping the gradients from exploding by clamping them at various points or stopping them from getting or vanishing them by clamping them. Stealing All right. Anything else I would like to add? I mean, this is good. So, we do gradient clipping uh, just to ensure that we don't, uh, our model doesn't diverge. Uh, but if you are doing gradient clipping along with using mixed precision, uh, the, the line which says scalar dot scale loss, you would also have to unscale it before applying gradient scale, uh, clipping. Again, this code is given in, in that link, which is uh, part of your standard notebook. So you, there's an example of how to perform gradient clipping along with mixed precision. Please look into it. And I would definitely recommend uh, implementing this as soon as possible so that you can run many more ablations. I mean, you'll probably at least run two, two times more ablations with using this trick versus without it. Any questions on this? All right, uh, if you are not using gradient clipping, what what would you be uh, using here? Instead of scalar.step, what exactly would <coughs> line of code would you be using here? So, okay, in this line we are Calculating uh, back, like we are doing back propagation from loss. What exactly are we doing in this line? Any guess? What do we do after back propagation? What do we do after we have calculated all the gradients? Exactly. So we are updating model parameters. So if we were not using gradient clipping, what exactly would the line of code be here? Optimizer dot, exactly. So still do keep in your mind what kind of code would you be writing when you're using mixed precision and what would be you be writing without mixed precision? Because I don't know, maybe you're using some very fancy optimizer where you're not, not able to figure out how to use mixed precision. So you might have to revert back to the traditional way of doing things. So it's, it's always good to have both approaches in your mind. But by default, use this wherever you can. Okay, weights and biases. Has anyone set up their account on one DB yet? Did people look at one DB recitation? Why do we use one DB? What is the purpose of that app, that website? So yeah. So we, <laughs> exactly. so we we are basically logging our results on WandaB, uh, whatever results you want to keep track of, whether it's training accuracy, training error, validation accuracy, validation error, et cetera. So I would suggest using this as a team. You can actually, you don't have to just do it individually. You can add yourself as a, you can add your team in this application and try to run ablations together as a team of, of your study groups, all four together. Another question, if you're looking at the graphs here, et cetera, we discussed overfitting uh, in a few slides before. Let me put that slide again. Yeah, so we discussed overfitting, but usually our data will not be a two-dimensional data, right? 
So we will not be able to get these kind of graphs for any uh, reasonable machine learning project. So how do we tell if, if our model is overfitting or not when we can't plot like this? Go ahead. Like the green and validation loss. Okay, and? And if the validation loss is like much higher than the training loss, then it's called you're overfitting on the training data. Okay, and why is that so? Because it is like hyper optimized on the training data and it's not generalizing well on the training data, so, so the error is more on the validation on, or on the training data. Okay, agreed. So if you see in your 1DB graphs that your training loss is way lower than your validation loss, you are probably overfitting. So what should you do next? If you conclude that you are overfitting. <laughs> Sorry, can you speak? Early stopping. Early stopping. Okay, early stopping, what else can you use if you are overfitting? Okay, drop out, what are the regularization? Okay, what else? <laughs> okay. Uh, you can try adding batch norm also. I was hoping to add that. Okay, so we discussed batch norm, we discussed activation, and we discussed why we need activation between lean and layers. What about batch norm? Should we do it before activation or after activation? Batch norm, should it, is it better before activation or is it better after activation? And what's the reason for it? So activation was for non-linearity, right? Yeah, but uh, you said that you have to make them be uh, yeah. So basically, we won't tell you when you should close the batch norm relation, but the hint would be to try out on the things after and before the activation. And that hint is because we don't know what's better. All right. Let's get back to mixed position, done, situation bias. All right, these are like the final tips for your homework. It would be better, again, to, uh, you know, divide and conquer. But by, by the way, has everyone checked their study groups? Because I've been talking study groups, study groups a long time. Is everyone, does everyone have a study group here? Is there anyone who does, has not yet made a study group? Okay. And those who already have study groups, do you also know your TA mentor assigned for it? So I would recommend reaching out to your group, reaching out to your TA mentor, set up a time, and decide a plan for how do you, how would you divide and conquer this homework? Because it's a very large data set. It's also your first homework, so it, there are many new concepts fl flying around. Uh, it's, it's always better if you start early and collaborate. Second is, uh, don't start with the biggest data set first. Uh, there, are, there are two folders, train clean 100, train clean 360, which is like 100 means 100 hours of, of recording, 360 is 360 hours of recording, so 100 is obviously smaller. Uh, secondly, we also have a toy data set. Is anyone aware where the toy data set is? is? So last week recitation, we showed how to do Libri speech. That was a toy data set. You can also play with that, run your ablations on that, and see, or you can uh, create a subset of your train clean 100 like 10%, 20% subset of your, because the, the smaller is your data that you're loading, the lower will be your per epoch time, and the more experiments you can run. Similarly, the, the simpler your model is, the lower will be your per epoch time, the more experiments you can run, or the higher your batch size is. There was a question in chat, which was a good question, that if you're loading 10% of your data, how can you make sure that it, it uh, you know, represents the entire data set well. Like it is, it's not skewed one direction or the other. So, yeah. Okay, good. Um, what other ways can we have? Because shuffling, like where do you shuffle the data? In which line of code do you shuffle the data? Is it the data set class? Is it the data loader? Where? Okay. And you, yeah, go ahead. Um, this might be specifically for labeled data, but uh, if you have certain classes, then you want to make sure that in the 10% of the equal distribution of those classes. 
yeah, or else you'll have unbalance. Oh. So how do you ensure that? Okay. Um, so one is uh, shuffle will be part of the data loader. So we do shuffle the training data, but we do not shuffle the validation data or test data. So why don't we shuffle validation test and why do we shuffle train? Because training data is something that just the model has seen, so we don't want it to overfit and get the order wrong. Right? Okay. But in validation and testing, it's something that hasn't seen data. At least for training or for testing, we have not seen that data. So even shuffling it, I think we will have more data. Okay, so like it's learning the training, it's not learning from validation or test. So shuffling won't really make a sense. What will happen if you do shuffle test data? You have to unshuffle it before. That's the problem. Because we have a certain order in our Kegel as your final submission. If you shuffle that test data set, you might have a random order and you might get all wrong. So for the data set, I would say uh, like randomly selecting uh, the data in the data set class itself might give you a better uh, balanced uh, subset of data set. But even before writing code for random selection of data, just start with the first 10% or first 20% of data and see some trends. Maybe the first 10% is good enough representation and you can work with that. If not, like if you're seeing different kind of ablation uh, trends on subset and the main data set, then yes, maybe you should randomize your selection. Second is, uh, because you're training deep learning, you might just start an ablation and you have to wait for a long time to get some results and then restart something else again. If you're doing it at the very end, near the deadline, you might just be sitting in front of your computer doing nothing because you're anxious how to, you know, will it cross the Hecatop or not this time. If you start early, you can multitask, you can keep something on training and you can probably do something else. So yeah, I'll recommend starting early. Uh, we will be releasing a few more architectures, like the Strata Notebook came with a very low cutoff architecture which is a bare minimum you should get if your notebook is running properly. We will release a low cutoff architecture and a medium cutoff architecture so that everyone at least crosses medium. But for high cutoff, you all will have to put in your own efforts, do your own experiments, and figure out what works and what doesn't. It's good that you start experimenting from the very low itself so that you have some idea of trends because choosing hyperparameters or the architecture is more about intuition than a very logical process. So the more ablations you run even now with smaller architectures, the better your intuition will be to help cross the high cutoff. All right, so we covered why we should not uh, train and validate. So pretty much we covered all of it. Uh, why do we use optimizer.zero grad? Why do we have to clear, clear them? Like what was that? Uh, like you said we have to clear the previous gradients. Mm -hmm. uh, one is why do we have to clear them and when should we clear them? Wait, what was the second part? When should we clear the gradients? When should we use oh, this? before the, before the, um, before you calculate the gradients. Well, before you calculate the gradients, so like once in the entire batch or once for every once. sample? Oh. When when should we clear it? Um once every pass. So once after every backpropagation pass. Yes. Okay. So every epoch argument. All right. And why do we have to clear it every time? Because like in high scores the optimizer will not clear up the computation graph and the gradient for you. So if you don't clear it manually, it will like the, in the next iteration, you will have like double the gradient, Good. and that will cause some problems. Good, and and you might learn why Pytorch does it this way because there is some future concepts which require gradients uh, preserved between multiple back propagation passes. But yeah, because we are doing with, working with linear layer, make sure for every after every pass you clear it, or before every pass you clear it, whichever works better for you.
Okay, so yeah, there's a question in chat asking about uh, what helps to convert F16 to 32 and what helps vice versa. So uh, because PyTorch already implements this, we don't have to worry about the low level uh, technicalities. Uh, you can still, I would recommend reading the long documentation. So things like linear layer, convolution layers, they work good enough with F16 also. Hence we do those computations in float 16 versus other things which, which require higher precision, we do them at flow 32. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. All right, second, why do we do torch inference mode? What's the objective of the second one? Torch dot inference mode. Yeah. Because you're not performing the propagation and point evaluation. Okay. And what advantage would this have? You're not uh, computing the gradients. Good. So if you don't need gradients that are computed, that way we'll have uh, better performance. All right. We did discuss why we need learning rate schedulers. And there are a few here. If you can try different examples. Uh, and if you read the documentation, they also uh, tell, talk about how to use them. So, and okay, these th three lines, torch, CUDA, MT cache, and GC collect, why are these used for? Delete is just to like give a Python variable to the garbage collector, but what are the other two used for? And when should we use, where should you use it, how often should you use it? Has anyone seen this before? Torch, CUDA, MT cache? What does it return usually? If anyone ran the starter notebook block? Okay, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. I guess we should use it always. Yeah, so one of these clears your GPU memory. One of these clears your CPU memory. You can search which one does what. And you should keep clearing your cache so that you don't run into out of memory issues. So, and like whenever you think, uh, like, you know, you had a very big list which you converted to NumPy and you don't need that list anymore. So you can use probably, uh, you know, one of these to clear that memory so that you have more RAM left for other processes. Um, number of workers. In our data loader, why do we have number of workers? Like what's their purpose? You would have seen num number of workers as a parameter, yeah. So what will happen if this value is zero? How many threads we will have total? Yeah, so if we have zero, uh, our data will load in the main thread. If we have one, we'll have one additional thread for loading data and so on. So if your RAM can support it, uh, go with a high number of uh, workers, like four is a good for, for training the uh, data loader. Um, the collab might limit it. Um, so there, there are certain restrictions on collab, but yeah, you can start with four and uh, if you are running into RAM issues, let's say in your local machine, you can try reducing the number of workers. Reducing it will obviously increase your training time, but it will ensure you don't run into out of memory issue because anytime you run into an out of memory issue, your entire training crashes. So you might have to play a bit with this number based upon your local machine or whatever cloud VM you're using. Second is, uh, I mean, I personally find CUDA related errors a little difficult to understand. Sometimes it's, it's not clear why exactly they exist. Uh, so you can always switch your device to CPU, run your entire code for like one epoch and see, uh, like it might make more sense uh, in that scenario. Uh, but you can only do this if you are using device, the, the initial code of first checking whether CUDA is available or not and using that device 
to move your data instead of actually hard coding where you are moving to CUDA and where you are moving to CPU. You can also try to have bias is equal to false in linear layers because we are using batch norm. Uh, but yeah, just, just run an experimentation to see if it is better or not. Um, it might, like making bias equal to false, might reduce the number of computations you have to do because batch norm will obviously uh, reset it back. <coughs> so bias might be like a useless parameter to begin with. And last, like most importantly, uh, do save checkpoints. If you're using Google Colab, save checkpoint on drive, not your Colab's local storage, because anytime the Colab crashes or terminates, you lose access to your checkpoints. And I saw some posts in Piazza, which uh, were also trying to unzip data in drive. That's not recommended. Uh, you should, like, because the, when you're mounting drive, it's like an external remote storage for that particular VM. And that particular VM will also have a storage attached directly to that VM through that, you know, like a hard disk SSD port. So the storage which is directly attached to the VM will have higher IOPS, higher input output uh, you know, per second. But the storage which is remotely added will also have a network latency, et cetera. So if you are loading data from the drive or unzipping data in the drive and then loading data from the drive, it will be extremely painfully long. Don't do that. Uh, start with data on the drive, uh, on your local storage of the Colab VM. It's fine if it crashes because you can always load it all, all over again from Kegel. But checkpoints are something you should always save in drive because uh, that will make sure you have access to it even if your Colab crashes. And that's the end of the presentation. Is there any question? I'm, I'm preparing to use like AWS Active Stream yeah. to train my model. So, is there any recommendation on like where should I put my data set? This should be either on like EC2 or the Elastic Cloud System. So, two things. One is I won't recommend using AWS right now. I would I would recommend saving those credits for uh, you know your project or future homeworks. But if you already have access to credits and you want to just try it, um, your data I would recommend putting it in a temporary storage. So it's the same logic as I mentioned for Colab. Uh, if you have it in temporary storage, it, it will load faster, and uh, it, whatever unzip zip you're doing, it's totally faster. But your checkpoint should be in your actual storage, which is your EBS, correct? And there's an option when you're, when you're creating a VM to make sure that if you ever delete your VM, your storage still stays. So if you're keeping all your checkpoint in the storage, you might want to keep the storage and delete it later once you're done with it. Um, one more tip, you might try downloading data in the EBS and copying it to your temporary storage every time because there's also a limit on how much data you can download into a VM after which they can start charging you. So you might have to do your calculations to see what costs you less, keeping data in EBS, like a 20 GB data in EBS for long or downloading it every time from Colab. So no, from Kegel, sorry. Any other question? Yeah. Um, can you explain mixed precision training a little bit? Is it like, does it basically like dynamically yeah. change the data type? Um, yes. Uh, so okay. certain calculations are performed on a lower data type, uh, like float 16, uh, which um, where the accuracy of 32 doesn't really add any further advantage. Okay. And certain calculations which require that high accuracy are done at float 32. So because we are doing it with the lower accuracy also, the lower data set also, it's faster. Okay. and. It's saying there's like GPU limits will it run on Colab? Mm, so like mixed precision training is supported by some of the GPUs and it's there for V100 which is supported by Colab. But like not all Colab instances get V100. So like I think Colab Pro gives V100 instances. The basic version supports K80. So even K80 supports mixed precision, but you might not get the two times performance out of it. So it depends upon how well the GPU supports it. So, and like some would get you moderate benefit, some would get you really good benefit, and some would probably have zero benefit. So experiment. Any other question? Yeah. So is it enough to just use the CPU on Google Collab or for, for the uh, prompt two, or is it like, would you recommend like getting like Collab Pro or something? Or can we use the cloud 
I would suggest like when you're writing your like when you're writing code, you can use a CPU version, which will be cheaper. Or if you're using free, it will not like have any limits. Uh, but to run like the to train the model, you would definitely need a GPU machine. Training on CPU, I, I mean, I'm not sure how long will that take or how feasible is that. Yeah. So is training on the free version like the free G the free version of the GPU not allowed? So you can run ablations with a toy data set or a, like a subset of the data on the free version, but loading the entire data set on free might not be possible. Okay. I haven't tried it, but it's- yeah, I would tell you the problem with training with Colab free is that you will often see that your training times are more than three hours, right? And Colab, the free version has this problem of, you know, you have to stay active on that tab. And you can't really stay, like sometimes you can do, but if you're trying to run your model training overnight, you are not able to keep, like make sure that these uh, collab notebooks are active. So collab pro allows you to kind of run it in the background. And that's why I would- Pro plus. Pro, pro plus allows it in the background, plus. yeah. Collab pro. Pro no. Okay, so collab pro has, like, it gives you more training time and it also gives you access to faster GPUs. So um, like Google recently changed the limits midway of last semester. Before that, uh, I mean, you had much more liberal limits, at least in my opinion. Obviously, their uh, uh, spokesperson would say it's still the same. So right now, um, if you're using GPU on free version for long enough time, they'll stop giving you GPU altogether. So after some time, you will only have a CPU machine. They will not give you C GPU at all. Um, with Pro, you can run trainings for at least like 12 hours roughly. With Pro Plus, you can run up to 24 hours. I would suggest you can start with Pro. Once, so once your starter notebook code is done, you can start with Colab Pro because uh, that would be probably a, a good starting point and it will ensure that you don't run out of GPU. And, but if, whether you, whatever version you are using, save checkpoints on drive because Colab can still uh, you know, disconnect anytime. Uh, it's, it's basically like running a spot instance of AWS. You are, you are, as long as compute is available, you're getting it. If it becomes, if demand is too high, you might like lose compute. And they even sometimes have this kind of capture to just make sure you're still in front of the machine or not. So if you don't click that I'm still here, it will probably disconnect again and you lose the checkpoint. So there are multiple caveats of using Colab, uh, it's, but it's still like, I would say quite affordable in terms of the compute you get per dollar. Uh, but yeah, you have to make sure you are saving checkpoints so that you don't run, you know, lose your work because of it. You'll also soon have like a recitation on GCP, which is like Google Cloud Platform, which you can connect to your Google Colab notebooks. And like the way we did homeworks was to make multiple accounts on GCP, and GCP kind of allows you some recordings. So, I mean, yeah, that's a way you can try to do your homework. Uh, and also, if you are if you have a local machine with, with GPU, but you like the Colab interface. So you can connect Colab with your local runtime also. It would be just like running a Jupyter Notebook. But it's, it's still easier to share code on Colab versus sharing a Jupyter Notebook, so yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, could you explain that normal version you need to use? So, What exactly are you unsure about it? I'm saying if you're like, why would you use it exactly? So like, there's no compulsion to use it, but we have observed that it has kind of given us better training performance. Mm -hmm. It just kind of stabilizes your performance, like training cycle. And it also kind of helps you with faster convergence. So when you're using Torch, batch normalization is just another module that you'll be using through the torch and builds. Uh, for homework one P2 and homework one P1, you'll be kind of writing the code for batch normalization. It's there in the write-up. So like there are more details on how you should perform the algorithm. Is there anything apart from that? Anything else? All right, so we'll be closing now. Yeah, so, um, we have a boot camp tomorrow from two o'clock to five o'clock. We'll share the location over Piazza. I would recommend at least reading the write-up before that. 
and if possible, try to complete the code as much as you can, and then come to the boot camp. Uh, based upon how like how much work has already been done by students, we might even teach advanced concepts. But if if, if everyone is stuck at still like you have still have to start the code part, then we'd have to go again with the basic concepts. Second is I have an office hour right, right after this from two to four. It's in Bean third floor. I'll share the location again. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Office hour Q, okay. Yeah. So I would say it depends upon every TA. Um, you can just check the calendar itself. If it mentions office hour Q, do uh, like uh, sign up for it. I don't take office hour Q. I just, like you can just come anytime to the room. Uh, Try not to come too late at the end of the office hour because the room will be booked by someone else. So I would just say, come a bit early. But for me, there is no queue. And I would like suggest you guys to maximize the output from boot camps and homework hackathons. All of these are like not required you to be there, but these are like these opportunities for you to grab where you can just get a hold of a TA and like you know discuss out with your classmates, and it will just help you. Uh, discuss ablations with more people, right? So homework hackathons and boot camps, they are not officially required, but they have helped me and yeah. even Sarthak a lot to complete the homework. All right.